Thank you so much, Vani ji, for that wonderful interaction, <laughs> introduction. Sorry. Um, I think more than all of that, I am a curious child <laughs> and uh, a determined learner. I just want to continue to learn and continue this beautiful journey of self-discovery. Um, we're going to be talking about the greatest stories ever told, and I'm sure you all will agree with me. Um, and while we delve into all of this, we're just being curious. So there's no offense or no opinion that is being made. But uh, let us all take it in stride because we're exploring the epic uh, for the first time, at least here in our setup. Um, using psychological themes. So they, there may be interpretations which we agree with, and then there may be interpretations which may not we may not agree with, which is okay. I mean, we are all entitled to have our own understandings and interpretations, but we're just trying to be curious over here. So excuse me and apologies before we begin if anything that we discuss here is of um, not in congruence with what you have learned and what you have grown to understand. Um, we are all familiar with this great epic, and I like to call it the Itihasa because I firmly believe that this is what has already happened. And it's not just mythology, like um, a lot of people even now believe. Um, so it all begins with It'll be nice if you can keep your videos on or interact with me during the session. Um, I am going to leave you with some pro profound questions towards the end of this so that we can all figure out what is happening within us. Um, again, encourage you to interact via chat or via your videos. Thank you so much. That's great. It's nice to interact with faces. Yes. Okay, uh, so it all begins with this. So just as you begin, we have turned on the camera for everybody. Uh, those who wish to turn on your cameras, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Uh, and if there are questions, we'll turn on the mic at that point of time, just to sure. avoid any disturbance in the recording. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So the story of the Mahabharata begins with, as we all know, Queen Satyavati. And uh, it is her ambition or over ambition, if you can say that, which begins the entire, uh, you know, ball rolling. And then events follow one after the other, and the mighty story unfolds itself. Um, so it all begins there where the Queen Satyavati is insecure, like we all have our own insecurities about her progeny, about her status in the kingdom after she gets married to King Shantanu. And that's when uh, Devivrat, the uh, son of Ganga, becomes Bhishma because of his Bhishma Pratidnya. We all know that, right? And that is where the whole um, ball gets rolling and events kind of follow each other in a way that there's no point of no return, right? And that's where the story starts itself, correct? And then we all, I'm sure, know the following events. So I'm not going to go into the details of that. But let's just understand these main characters, right? So there is Queen Satyavati who symbolizes ambition. And then there is Bhishma Pitamaha who symbolizes the law abiding person, right? He's that uh, figure in the Mahabharata. We have Dhritarashtra, who is the, who's victimized, who victimizes himself because of being um, visually blind from birth and is unable to accept that fact throughout his life. Um, he wishes to live vicariously through his sons, the life that he couldn't live. And in that event, uh, in that context, promises his son to make him the king. And that's the ambition he follows. That's the thought that he has. And then we have the other major character who's Gandhari, who's chosen to respond to her situation in a certain way. She's not blind, but she's chosen to be blind. And in those that whole 
um, series of events which take place after Bhishma reaches out to her father and they believe that she's been pushed into this marriage and that's her way of you know digesting that disappointment or resentment of, of being a beautiful princess but being married to a person who's blind and so she so she chooses to not see what she could otherwise have seen right and then we have uh, the Pandava mother, Kunti, who is again an embodiment of innocence, vulnerability, um, devotion to every role that she plays, devotion to uh, practically every role that she plays, of her being the member of the family of this um, you know, uh, uh, Kauravas or the Kururashtra, and then being the mother to her sons. Um, the Pandavas are, of course, the five pillars of dharma, as Krishna describes them. The um, Nyaya, Prem, Samarpan, Samarthya, um, Jnana and Dhairya. They all symbolize all of these things. Um, Karna, of course, is again another symbolic representation of loneliness, vulnerability, right? Someone who's the orphan. And Duryodhan, jealousy, arrogance. Uh, Dushasana is a blind follower of instructions who's, who's not used his own um, understanding of the situation to respond to it. And then we have Shakuni, who's of course a complete embodiment of revenge. Correct? Now, what are these? These in psychology might be referred to as archetypes. And what are archetypes? We all have archetypes. All stories have archetypes. There is the hero, there is the villain, there is a shadow, there is this wise person or the sage or someone who's, you know, the guiding light of this entire story, right? And most stories, most epics, most cultural, religious um, literature will follow these archetypes, right? And all of us have these within us. So the Mahabharata is a part of our collective understanding, right? It's a collective understanding. It forms a basis of a lot of our conditioning. A lot of our belief system, value system comes from the Mahabharata. That's where the teachings come from. And that's how we influence our decision making, style of living. What do we prioritize as a culture? What do we prioritize as a way of life? All of it comes from here. So these are universal patterns that we see, the archetypes. And they occur repeatedly across history, if I may say so, across culture, across religions. We have these archetypes which show themselves up repeatedly time after time. Do we learn? No. Mankind is not supposed to learn from history. We're not programmed to learn from history. And that's the reason history repeats itself. But these are found everywhere. They are a part of our collective consciousness, like I said, and conditioning. They represent our deep-seated psychological tendencies. We are all um, a part of this. It's a part of our psyche. That's where the word comes from, right? The psyche. We all share this. It's a shared knowledge base, shared consciousness, shared understanding of the right, wrong, dharma, adharma, good, bad, evil, etc. So therefore, it influences our attitudes and belief systems, and therefore, it influences our choices. Mahabharata, if you see, is a story of choices, of who chose to do what at that point of time. And what if they had chosen something else? Maybe the history would have been different. I read this somewhere, and I found it to be very interesting. And it said that if the Kauravas had won the war, we would be worshipping Shakuni and not Krishna. Does that make sense? What do you think? Had the Kauravas won the war, we would have been worshipping Shakuni and not Krishna. Because both, have, both are magicians. Both are tricksters. Both are the same archetype. Right? But we say that one stood in the dharm ke pakshme. Because... Probably they won the war. History has always been told by the victorious. I don't know, I'm curious, right? 
but what does it bring us to it brings us to choices it all comes down to choices how do i choose to respond in a certain situation when i have been zapped of everything when the kaurava when the pandavas present themselves duryodhan's whole world shatters because he's been promised the throne he's been looking forward to something he's been the ambition has been planted in him watered and nurtured in him by his own maternal uncle which is shakuni mama and now he's done everything even planned to kill in the lakshagraha but now when the pandavas have presented themselves this person's whole world is shattered much like draupadi's world is shattered when she is uh, when the vastra haran takes place in the sabha but what he chooses to do with his resentment anger and what she chooses to with her uh, to do with her resentment and anger defines the course of history basically right so it all comes down to choices and what influences these choices aren't we also making choices day in and day out we are supposed to make choices at all points in life we have always chosen and when you choose you always miss out what am i ready to give up and what do i really seek and if i know what i seek what am i ready to give up in my journey to seek that which i really seek it all comes down to down to the choices that we make okay why are we talking about this because all of these archetypes are not outside they exist within me i have all of them in me ram bhi main hu ravan bhi main hu i am the hero i am the anti hero i am the villain right so this is the conflict there is a mahabharat within and it's always happening right so how how does this help the study of archetypes understanding these archetypes contributes to, for us it contributes in identifying patterns what are my patterns what do i follow where is my villain where is the villain within me right where is that um, dark side what is the dark side of me and what is the good side of me what is the light side of me right and therefore with all of this mahabharata once i have this battle is raging within me and it is all about the hero coming home the journey of the hero coming home ram becomes ram not in the battlefield of lanka he becomes ram when he returns to ayodhya the return is very important the return is very important right so it's the journey and my journey is towards seeking my own self the journey of self discovery i recently learned in a workshop that i attended and it was a revelation to me that every time you delve into these journeys and you try figuring these archetypes within you you realize that there is so much in you that you still don't know and therefore it becomes a never ending journey and when does it end it ends only with death and when we talk about death i'm not just saying the physical death but my self journey to self discovery will stop even if there is death in mind or spirit it's not only about the body so am i still irrespective of my age experience knowledge willing to continue on this journey with my mind body and soul is a question that's a choice am i willing to embark on this am i willing to continue this journey despite whatever comes um, ahead of me in front of me or am i someone to to you know become bitter and tie my eyes like gandhari so that i don't have to see and face what comes am i making sense any questions any any interactions reflections any observations comments by you guys 
the chat's open too. Anyone has any comments, you can unmute and speak. The mic is opened up. Here, we got body, vital, and physical. Yes. Actually, the vital and mind, it will act. Yes. If the mind wins, it becomes a positive. If vital wins, it becomes a negative. So vital mm -hmm. requires his enjoyment in everything. Their mind wants to have a positive side. So it depends upon individual how he controls his vital or mind. Correct. So mind is more important to turn to a positive side than the vital. That's Absolutely. what I think. Correct. Very true, very true. Thank you for adding to this discussion. Uh, it really enriches the whole process. And um, like you said, it is all about finding that meaning and purpose. But will it do to do only one and ignore the other? Maybe not. And that's the balance that we seek to see now that we turn into this, the Mahabharata within us. Every character in the Mahabharata has a flaw, right? And we all have, I like to use this metaphor, we all have our dragons. Perfection might be my dragon. Um, someone else's dragon might be um, completely abiding to the rules, to the T, not changing anything. Somebody else's dragon might be um, ethics. I'm a very ethical person, right? And all of us have such identities if i can use the word right and how much should i allow myself to be perfect how much perfection is enough and when to stop and when to uh, let go of it is also very important because the dragon has a fire remember do i need the fire oh yes I do need the fire because that fire keeps me going. But should it be too much, then there is a danger that that fire consumes me. Should I allow my fire to consume me? And that's what has happened over here on this side of Mahabharata. Bhishma's fire, Bhishma's dragon, was the dragon that protected him all through his life, was his dharma baddhata the abiding nature that i will abide by all my promises i will sacrifice everything so that others are happy right versus his rigidity this became rigidity you know it's like that elephant the elephant whose, whose leg has been tied to a little pole from the time that the elephant was a calf. Now the elephant has become bigger. The elephant has grown. Now the elephant has the power to pull away from this peg. But this peg continues to hold the elephant in control. Bhishma could not withdraw, let go of that rigidity or that abiding nature of his or his pratignya for the greater good. He was too focused on his dragon and it is that dragon fire that consumed him in the end. Okay? You take any other example, Dhritarashtra. The blindness was a weakness or in his head a weakness which grew, which led to a lot of other frustration, bitterness, which led to him wanting to live his life vicariously through his son. And that Putra Moha came in the way of him being a good father. And when his son was not corrected, when his son was supposed to be corrected or when he could have been corrected, it led to the whole epic. It led to the whole Mahabharata, right? The bitterness was his dragon the power became his dragon 
the fire that he was consumed with. Gandhari's choices of tying that thing on her eyes. How have we have we not not been like that? Not addressing the elephant in the room. I don't want to look at it. It's too much. Have have we all found ourselves there? I'm sure we have. I'm sure we all have. In little spaces in life when it was just too much, we just decided to turn a blind eye to it, not really addressing the problem, because addressing the problem would have been unpleasant. And then you realize that the problem became bigger and later it pre presented itself to you and you had to take it head on. Right? Had she not decided, had she not chosen to tie her eyes, had she been there, had she become the sight, the vision of her husband, she would have been able to protect her children from her own brother. She would have been able to see, metaphorically see, what her brother was doing in her family. And she would have probably been able to avoid a little bit of it. We all put it down to Vidhika Vidhan, I know. But we're just being curious. We're just trying to understand what happens if Gandhari opens her eyes and sees for what things are and not turn a blind eye to things, right? Are you, are you being able to relate these identities within us? The bitterness, the frustration of something that I did not get like Dhritarashtra had. It was his right. He was the eldest. He was actually the heir, but he did not get it. So something that I'm, I think I'm entitled for, but I don't get it. How does that make me feel? Do I become like him in those spa spots, in that context? Do I become like Gandhari when it is too much for me? I don't want to see. I deny the existence of it. I refuse to accept its presence. Yeah. And then we have Duryodhan. Of course, we have found Irsha within us at multiple points in time. Maybe not as big and not as great and not as pronounced as Duryodhan, but we have found that element in us. We may not have acted upon it. And what helped us not acting upon it? These teachings, this collective consciousness that we have within us, and we'll get there in a while. Have we been blind? Uh, to orders that have been given to us. I know it is wrong, but I'm doing it because someone else is telling me to do it. Or I'm blindly doing what someone is asking me to do. Am I not behaving like Dushasana? He was told to do. Duryodhan didn't do it. Duryodhan didn't do the Vastraharan. Dushasana did it. And he was asked to do it and he acted upon it without using his own. Do, have we done this? Have we been in this place ever before? in life? I'm sure we have. I'm sure we've had these moments. Right? Just take a moment. Just think about this. We felt jealous. We felt entitled like Duryodhan. We felt I deserve it. How, how come I don't get it? We felt the resentment. We, fe we felt the anger. And then we have Shapuni on one side. Who's the trickster? Who's the magician? And there's a backstory which says that he was also wronged. So the reason why he was seeking revenge was also is also given, right? But when someone wrongs you, how do you make use of that? Draupadi was wronged too. What happened to her was very unfortunate. What did she do? How did she respond? How did her family respond? And how did this person respond? Yeah? So revenge, resentment, and when I tie myself to this, then I am continuously running behind that pratishod. And I assume or believe that that's where I will find my peace. Someone said something to me, I want to get back at them. Right? For how long can I be compassionate? Compassion versus tolerance. How long can I be compassionate? There is a boundary that I must draw. Otherwise, people will keep saying and I will keep listening. How does that work? Right? And we have Karna, one of the, the tragic hero of Mahabharata. Vulnerable, ostracized, orphaned. And therefore, 
goes behind validation. He wants samman, validation, respect. Validation of him being a certain warrior of a certain degree by people. Why does he want that? Why does he desire validation? Aren't we all like Karna? We desire the validation. Right? And I was thinking of this when Varniji was reading out those qualifications of mine, <laughs> silently laughing. Because we if someone asks me, who am I? That's my identity. I am a psychologist. I am this. I have done these certifications. Why am I saying this? I desire validation. We all desire validation. Is it wrong? No. But how far will you go to receive that validation is a choice. How far will you go to abide by the promise that you have taken is a choice. How far will you go to not see what's happening in front of you is a choice. How far you will go to take revenge, how far will you go for the sake of jealousy is a choice. And these choices matter, don't they? Now, um, this is when, when we have this Mahabharata raging within me, there is also this conflict. How much is enough? When to stop? What is the right thing to do? And what is righteousness? Where do I get these answers from? I'm sure we've all faced dilemmas. Right? And when you are in a dilemma, how do you get these answers? Just take a moment to yourself and write to me or talk to me and tell me where do these answers come from? The answers actually come from within, but there is somebody who is saying, I got the answer in between. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Very true. Yes. And who is this somebody? Bingo, probably. Uh huh. Ego, ego. ego in, okay. in, in just, just on the lines of what you said, someone who is seeking validation. Someone who is seeking validation. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a second level uh, thought, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. I see. I see. Yeah. And and just uh, that you mentioned about you were mentioning about the dragons and uh, one of the dragons of perfection or values. How far do we go? Um, I think the point, the observation you made uh, that they are both protective and destructive is very true. Yes. Um, I mean, it can be validated by anyone <laughs> that yeah. it can be protective at times. But the thing about all these things, I feel, uh, just as I was contemplating on what you were talking, is both values like perfection or ethics we take it to be fixed mm. whereas uh, life is not fixed so therefore it is dynamic so perfection at an individual level perfection is instantaneous for a given situation correct at a universal level if you take nature or creation for example it's already perfect Yes. But it, it realizes its consistency in perfection by creating imperfections locally. Right. Uh, otherwise, there is no flow of energy or consciousness in, in the world. Absolutely. So there are two levels that we can look at. Uh, as an individual, I cannot take any of these values to be constant. It, it is, mm. I have to keep dynamically adjusting quote unquote whoever that i means <laughs> uh, adjusting but at the universal level nothing needs to be done about perfection because it's already perfect absolutely wow how well that is put wonderful it is amazing to see that these are the collective qualities that we bring through these scriptures these things and like uh, you rightly said it is not about the extremes and it is not rigid it is not static it is dynamic and it is a, therefore krishna says dharma is a river the river flows it finds its way and if time comes it can cut through a rock cut through a mountain can it not and how beautiful that is so what is righteousness what is righteousness 
in one context may not be righteousness in any other context right like um bhishma was being righteous because he was the servant of hastinapur and therefore could not call anything out against what was happening in the youth sabha but on a larger scale was he following the dharma of being human was he following the dharma of being a man a uh, an elderly person of the family who is supposed to protect the women and ensure that they are treated with respect dharma it has to be malleable righteousness perfection any quality has to be malleable moderation has to be brought about and there's a there are a few interesting shlokas which i came across which i will present to you towards the end of this session which also speaks about val, val, moderation in in the gita okay let's move to this side now we have kunti and there's a conflict there there are two extremes morality devotion versus naivety foolishness she time and again goes back and takes her sons back to that particular toxic environment which she knows is not good for them why does that happen and she is told by krishna that you are thinking of only your family when you are saying my sons are not interested in any they are not interested in the kingdom they don't want to be kings it's all right but what will happen to the world to the subjects of that kingdom if they get a king like duryodhana and yet again for the greater good she comes back so one might argue is there a balance is there a harmony between these two things should there have been another way to stop duryodhana from becoming the king would she have taken that should she have taken that but she is nevertheless a steadfast mother and even in the wake of all the restrictions that has that have been put on her she stands steadfast she accepts she is i i think she is a beautiful embodiment of acceptance she accepts her fate let's go of karna she accepts her fate and remember her vardhan is also a result of her relentless service to uh, rish, the to rishi oh, i'm forgetting the name can someone give me the name who who blesses kunti with the uh, vardhan that she'll be able to get uh, children from rishi durvasa durvasa yes rishi durvasa thank you so uh, so that comes from a place of service again and then she lets go of her first child and then she lets go of the fact that um her husband marries another princess then she accepts her um, um fate when her husband takes the vanvasa she accepts her fate when she uh, has to share her vardhan with her um co-sister or sotan as we can call her she accepts her fate when her husband dies she wants to go sati but then madri goes sati and she accepts her fate again that now i have to live with this entire life and she accepts her fate multiple times when her sons are wronged but she continues on that path steadfast it's a beautiful embodiment of acceptance it's a beautiful character which teaches us um acceptance a, a lot of people may say it's sacrifice i wouldn't i personally would like to think of it as acceptance it's a remarkable acceptance of what comes come what may i will not waver and that takes a lot of courage extreme courage isn't it out of the all the people in mahabharata could i really admire her for her courage it's it's just beyond i think a human person to take all of it in and yet continue in a steadfast manner right um yudhishthira again righteousness versus naivety why is it that the dyut sabha happens why is it that he considers his own brothers and his own wife as property that he can bet on how is it that these things unfold why are these rules like this and why can a person who's dharma gyani not stand up against these things and 
say that this is not dharma how does this unfold what is going on in yudhishthir's mind in that yudh sabha when he is betting his people his family one after the other what's happening here is it naivety is it foolishness is it is it taking the righteousness too far and not being able to draw that line where is the flaw is there a flaw or is it okay in the context of those times is it all right i'm being curious i don't know um bhim is again a dual character strength immense strength but temperament right so that's his flaw the temperament arjun also is the hero of this entire epic it is his journey from point a to point b from self um, from from awareness to discovery to actualization it is his journey and who is he aided with he is aided by the krishna himself the god himself the narayan himself right and we see this whole arc from confusion to acceptance to doing what is required in his journey in those moments in the battlefield right but like um i was saying before there is this character who's another major character the major force the driving force of mahabharata which is draupadi what has she gone through she was also wronged just like many other characters in mahabharata she was also wronged she was promised something but got something else she is also an excellent embodiment of acceptance again right she had the choice to leave and go back to her father's house she chooses a life full of penance so that she is able to purify her soul mind and body to be present for each of the pandava brothers it's it's a life full of penance tapasya but what comes her way is something that she does not absolutely deserve and none of her trusted people including her husbands stand up for that it is only her dear friend krishna who comes to her rescue right there also we see a conflict which is her penance her dedication and her passion versus the anger and the revenge now was her anger and was her requirement of revenge misplaced one would say may not be because she was wrong but then by that is it wrong for duryodhan to seek revenge then is it wrong for shakuni to seek revenge because even she had made this pratigna that i will wash my hair with his blood so she also held the revenge within her but the way these two people responded is what created the difference she used her situation to ensure that the cleansing of aryavarta was done she used her situation to understand that she stood there and she could have cursed the sabha but she did not curse she remembered krishna's words krishna had told her sayam rakhna you know sayam there's no english word for sayam and therefore i end up using these hindi sanskrit words because there is language is so rich sayam is just sayam it cannot be anything else and she holds it in her she digests it and she recreates it into something more beautiful she uses it as a driving force and ensures that her husbands clean the place of adharma she does not become bitter she does not victimize herself she is not seeking revenge for her it's not a personal vendetta but duryodhan's is duryodhan's when it is personal i want the throne shakuni's is personal i want this to happen to hastinapur because i want to bring about the downfall of bhishma but here it's not personal and that is why we find the krishna in their in their side behind them with them ahead of them and what is this krishna now when we are talking about mahabharata as my inside conflict 
the kauravas definitely represent moh bandhan asvikriti denial irsha jealousy lob krodh lalach right pratishodh these are the uh, representations of the kauravas and on this side we have righteousness strength nyay dhairya samarthya right all of this is on this side where is krishna what is that within me that makes me choose this versus that that is my inner compass that is my inner voice that is the krishna within that which makes me make those decisions in different contexts that which makes me analyze what is right and wrong in this context that which gives me a sense of direction upholding all these values is my krishna within if if we look at mahabharata like this which is happening within me my inner voice is my krishna my super ego my morality my sense of direction is kunti and that, that's my, that's within me right and then the five basic values which guide me on the path of righteousness dhairya samarthya prem samarpan gyan and nyay these are the five pillars which drive me on this path which are the representation of pandavas now, all of this cannot work if i don't have draupadi's tapasya because it's a journey it's consistency it's determination discipline repetition so without the tapasya none of this makes sense but if i have this then i know that there is this inner voice within me and i can hear this inner voice to get rid of all of these the moh the lobh the pratishodh krodh irsha and asvikriti non acceptance exact opposite of acceptance on this side is it making sense is it really making sense to any of us yeah and in this context therefore krishna says i am within you and here i'll show you this shloka and therefore krishna says when we are talking about krishna is my inner voice the kauravas are the are the emotional like someone was mentioning the vitals and then this is the sat sat vivek is what we call right the, the this side of the um, battle that rages within us and therefore krishna says i am within you i am in you and therefore all that we need is within us i'll share these slides so don't worry about that uh, the uh, reference is given here chapter 10 verse 20 and then he says ask for me look for me and i will come and who's saying this if i can connect with myself i can find my inner voice i will rediscover it i will discover it i will find it in the right moments it may sound like someone i know it may look like someone i know but it is there and so he promises and he says paritranaya sadunam i will come sambhavami yuge yuge and then of course this is something that is used all the time for us to realize that when he comes there will this will happen the revival of dharma will happen so when i become aware of the krishna within me i can be i can rest assured that i will seek the right path and i will take the right path and what we were talking about uh, moderation is here regulating desires through moderation going about a balance in that so too much of nothing is okay right too much of ambition is also not okay but can we do without ambition no too much of god will take care of everything is not okay will i not have to do the karma which is this perform without expectations without attaching yourself to the expectations karmanye vadikar is one of the most profound ones which we hear everywhere that too much of anything is not okay right and yes that's it that i have to share with you guys i have 10 questions but i will share those with you uh, in a while keeping in mind these archetypes that we've just been through 
and and for the sake of repetition let me just go over it again because we have the time um, we are looking at the mahabharata that is waging within me okay and in me i have a lot of these characters here we notice the difference bring your curiosity to this bandhan versus maryada again i'm using our words because there's no translation in english that will really or maybe there is but i feel it just doesn't convey the same thing bandhan is the limitation it it limits you but maryada is your dignity it upholds you it allows you to be who you are in that context while upholding your values and the dharma without really uh anything mattering but that didn't happen and therefore we use the word bandhan for bhishma asvikriti the denial in gandhari irsha in duryodhan lobh again in dhritarashtra ahankar of shakuni and duryodhan pratishodh krodh all of these are on one side and we all have these aspects in us yeah and then we have on this side dhairya samarthya prem samarpan gyan nyay and the morality along and the devotion bhakti along with the tapasya right and where do we turn depends on your krishna on the inner voice within you right and when we look at life like this i have a few questions for all of you the first question is how do you balance your warrior spirit with compassion and empathy how much of compassion and empathy will i show and where is that line where i where i draw my boundary and i tell people that i will tolerate and endure this but beyond this i will not i will assert not for my gain but for the greater good just like arjuna did he respected his teacher he had to fight against his teacher he had to fight against his own grandfather grand uncle he had to fight against his own brothers and that's when the gita was told to arjuna so how, when, where is my line contemplate and i'll appreciate answers on the chat if there are any how much of compassion is enough how do i draw my boundaries do i allow people to take advantage of me being a value based person ethical person righteous person we live in a world where ethics and righteousness can be taken advantage of how do i stand up for those how do i stand up to those i have to see that i i'm not unjust to myself also not allow mm. others to you know walk over me and take yeah. me it when i know that what i'm standing for the right absolutely and isn't that a constant battle absolutely it is yeah in relationships at work at Where? home in, within the family in in fact even within ourselves it's a constant battle how much is enough should i should i not the soliloquy to be or not to be continues mm, right true. thank you for sharing thank you so much my second question to all of us is what have been my personal duryodhan moments when is it that ego and greed have overcome me and how have i dealt with those tendencies remember i may not have acted on it but it has occurred and how have i overcome those tendencies how have i dealt with those th tendencies think about it take time reflect when did irsha make its way into my life i remember the very old onida ad neighbors envy owners pride because we are all group in meditation study circle we are studying we get always a positive ideas only not negative we not go enter to all of us <laughs> yes that is another dra another drawback with us to yeah. go for negative news. correct i'm sure i'm sure i absolutely agree with you but yet emotions are universal so there is no there's no way that i have never 
had this fleeting feeling in me not now maybe young when i was younger when i was a little less um immature a little less mature i'm sure we've all all had these moments what if oh she has this i don't oh i also want something like they oh they are going here i want to go there you know we've all been through such moments we may not have acted on it but it has occurred and then we've told ourselves that it is not it is not for me to think like this or instead of this let me think like that we've all had our coping mechanisms to kind of overcome these tendencies and if we have not had great i think the krishna within you is very strong then <laughs> no I, uh, one is pushing it down though it comes up you try to push it down and say no it's not okay for me to feel like this yes it yes. was okay and it starts in the very beginning in your childhood when there are yes. that's the time that's the time that's very true and therefore these ideas of what is good and what is not good are very rigidly placed yes right um it would be good to not shame our children or our grandchildren for having emotions it is okay for them to feel jealous and as a psychologist i tell this to all my clients also that it is okay for you to feel angry it is okay for you to feel insulted it is okay for you to grieve it is okay for you to feel jealous what is not okay is responding to those emotions in unhelpful ways creating unhealthy coping mechanisms to deal with those emotions will lead to heartbreaks or um, uh, lo lo loss of peace of mind but if i am able to channelize these you see all emotions are valid and all emotions are okay to feel we will feel them whether you agree or not you will feel them what do you do with them is a choice how do you respond to that is a choice right there's no way draupadi could not have felt angry after what happened to her she accepted the anger she digested it and she realized that i can use this for a greater good for a greater purpose right so yeah and all that was my, yes so she took uh, help from krishna she had that faith that she could call upon him so when yes. you have that faith i think it helps you to overcome absolutely absolutely faith is the foundation of everything isn't it yes faith can move mountains okay so my next question is how do you find your voice and stand up for what you believe in even when you're faced with challenges like draupadi when you found yourself absolutely at the rock bottom draupadi's rock bottom came from people insulting her and people not standing up for her your rock bottom may have come some other way but when you did hit your rock bottom how did you find your voice how did you assert yourself bring yourself back stand up again and stand up to your bullies i'm sure we all have had bullies at home at workplace in the family in friend circles how did we st stand up to those bullies reflect here in all circumstances if mm. you believe it's the divine definitely mm. will he will show to help mm. us absolutely but one yes without divine help one cannot do anything else so that's so dopati first she divine next to help their husbands she change her pattern of life to help them Correct. even though they did not care but divine is there to help you. so even today also whatever trouble comes whatever this thing if you surrender to divine definitely in one way or other he is going to help us that's what i feel absolutely and you are absolutely right and where is the divine where is it the is divine within, it is within. within it is inside us correct it is within us and that realization that i have something within me to fall back on is very liberating isn't it i have something in me that will help me and see me through the storms of my life is very liberating isn't it sure we have to go inside yes 
Absolutely. Okay, this one's interesting. How do you find solace and strength in your faith or spiritual beliefs? How do you find it? Like Kunti found in her spiritual beliefs, her strength. How do we find our strength in these beliefs? Replacing negative thoughts with positive ones, going back to the Who Am I meditation. It's lovely. Right? The other question is for us to contemplate again what are my personal vows or commitments, like Bhishma had, that I am willing to uphold? What are my personal vows? or commitments that I am willing to uphold? And what is the cost that I am paying for it? What is the cost that I pay for upholding those beliefs? Where is that rigidity in me? Reflect. In context of your own lives, your own families, what are those rules that I have created for myself, which I refuse to give up? What benefit does it bring to me? And what is the cost that I pay to be that person? Another important question to reflect. And my last question would be, what is your personal Krishna? within you? What is your guiding force? And how do you seek that guiding force's wisdom and guidance? Is it a person in your life? Is it your master? Is it your guru? Or is it someone else? Who's your role model? Where does this definition of the inner voice of the inner compass of morality, devotion, definition. Where does it all come from? How do I define all of this in my life? Someone says the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. And I firmly believe that anything and anything you have, you can reach out to the Gita and it is relevant even today. From all angles, warfare, politics, economics, psychology, it's just a perfect source of knowledge and wisdom. So I'll agree with you. Yes, teachings of Gita. Yes, it's an absolutely practical guide. In Mahabharata, each Mahabharata. in each individual person, we have to study him. Very true. That's more important. See, Very take true. Bhishma, Bhishma, or Karna, or Duryodhana, Kunti or Draupati, you study each individual character, then you will have some idea about this one. If you take Karana, ego is more. If you take Duryodhana, he never thought of the positive side, only full of negative side. Correct. If you take Shakuni and Krishna, Krishna mm. is Dharma, Shakuni is bad elements. Correct. So in Mahabharata, we have to study each person's character, then we have to decide which is good for us. Correct. That's what I feel. Absolutely. See, it's it's so interesting. Like I was saying, now this, this parallel between Shakuni and Krishna, I find it very interesting. I find it very intriguing. Both are magicians. More, both are tricksters, right? In, in the world of archetypes. Uh, now, this is out of the religion or out of the fact that we look at Krishna as God. But if we just compare these characters of the story, we realize that there was chal on both ends. Okay, Krishna had also created sunset-like conditions by uh, hiding the sun with his Sudarshan Chakra so that Jayadrat could be killed. Krishna had told Arjuna or, uh, you know, recommended that he kills Karna from the behind, which is against technically the law war, the war laws of those times correct but this is where the intention comes in the intention behind this side was 
for the greater good. They didn't. They were not doing what they were doing for the sake of their win. They were doing what they were doing for the greater purpose. Yes, dharma sanstapana thai. And they were doing what they were doing for personal gain. And that intention is what makes the difference. So therefore, Krishna says that your, your dharma is not in the thought. Your dharma is in the intention and action. The action has to be in a way that achieves the intention, which is for a greater good. And there is one point, uh, I don't remember where I read the story, but there's one point where Krishna has a dialogue with Karna. I think it is from the book Mrityunjaya. And he tells Karna that, um, Karna, Karna asks him, what is wrong? If I want to seek validation and I want the son, someone that I want, I am capable of it. So why not? Why does the society not allow me to be a warrior? Why does my birth have to decide what I do? And then Krishna tells him that, what you're saying is absolutely right. But if you had used your personal uh, loss to, uh, to um, work for the entire tribe, if you had done it for a greater cause, if you, had, if you had not fought for your Samman, but if you had fought for the Samman of the entire tribe, then that would have been a more, um, a more uh, what can I say? A more fulfilling, a more righteous act. But what you did was for the personal gain, which is in your case respect. Karna wanted respect. Karna wanted validation. Karna wanted recognition from people that yes, he is a great warrior. And he time and again tried to only prove that he um, uh, will. He is greater than Arjun. But that became his personal vendetta. And Krishna tells Karna that. If you had not done this, then you would not have been standing on the wrong side of this war. You would have then been on the right side of this war because you would have then fought for the Samman of your entire tribe and not your entire caste, your entire whatever that social strata and not just for yourself. But you made it about yourself and that's why you ended up where you are. Correct? And yes, there was ego. I will agree with you. Karna did have that aspect in him. So again, if the Mahabharata, if the Mahabharata was history and if the war was won by the Kauravas, would we have been worshipping Shakuni in place of Krishna? I don't know. Worth thinking, right? When we when when we are saying this. We are saying this from the point of view of Mahabharata as a story that unfolded as a as a actual event that happened. And therefore, if we believe the tenet that the victorious write the history, then we don't know which way. But if they had to argue, they would say that they were cheated and therefore they lost. Right? And, and maybe that is true. But again, what matters is the intention. The intention of this side of Mahabharata was definitely the greater good. And therefore, the Narayan himself stood by their side. So there will be conflicts. There will be storms. I'm reminded of a cricket match, cricket matches, where yeah. uh, the man of the match many times is declared on the losing side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who, who the hero no. is doesn't always depend on this. <laughs> Absolutely true. Sorry about that's... it, but I just thought that, that's no, it. No. <laughs> all of these examples and all your contributions make the whole process very, very enriching and interesting. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for pitching in. And uh, there is the conflict. The conflict goes on. It is an endless conflict. The Mahabharata and the Manthan will continue. The conflict will continue whether how much is enough, how much is too much, how much is too less, where to draw the line. It will continue. But if we have that inner voice and if we have the uh, companionship of Tapasya, Tudhairya, Prem, Samman, Gyan, Nyaya and Samarthya, I'm sure we'll be able to listen to that inner voice and walk in the sense, walk in the uh, direction of um, 
what you believe to be dharma and like it was previously said very rightly so everything here is flexible malleable and therefore dharma is like a flowing river so i wish you that may each of you find the krishna within you and may he bless us all and may he live within us until the end of time thank you so much i will send all these questions to vani ji there are a few that i have skipped so maybe you can share it on the group and it might be a good time to you know a good way to reflect on the archetypes within me and identifying the patterns within me and continuing on my journey through various approaches to self discovery may we all find the krishna within us thank you